going to be based on the World Cup. I don't know if you have attended to any World Cup in your life, but it's something amazing, something really massive, something really big. Estamos preguntando a todos los que estamos aquí en este World Football Summit si alguna vez habéis estado en algún tipo de competición como un mundial, una Copa del Mundo, porque es una de las cosas más grandes que uno se puede encontrar y sobre todo en el mundo del fútbol, seguramente lo, lo más grande. Imagine then if you have not attended to a World Cup, how would be three countries, three of the biggest countries on earth, Mexico, United States of America, and Canada, taking place and holding a World Cup. I think it's going to be the, the biggest World Cup of all time. It's going to take place in 2026. And that's why this panel is going to be dedicated to that World Cup, which is already working. You know how things work in the USA, and it's going to be, for sure, the biggest World Cup on football history. Por eso, precisamente, el panel de ahora va a ir dedicado a ese Mundial de 2026 que van a co colaborar y que se va a realizar en Norteamérica, entre México, Canadá, Estados Unidos, y por eso ya se está trabajando en ello. Y de ahí que les presente a los siguientes eh, protagonistas para un panel espectacular y que va a cerrar un poco el, la mañana de esta primera jornada del World Football Summit. Please welcome Chad Biagini, John Cripscrit, Darren Eels, Steve Cannon y Íñigo Riestra. A big applause for them, please. Chad, welcome. Over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We have the privilege of getting to talk about the upcoming World Cup throughout North America. And I'll dive right into it. You've already heard some of the scale uh, in the introduction. John, I'll volley it to you. How did a three-country bid even come together? Well, I think the best way to start is uh, when the, the, the new FIFA president uh, ushered in the 2.0 vision and some of their thoughts about the future, one of the key ones was expanding the format to the largest World Cup ever where you'd have 48 teams in, in 80 matches. And as uh, many of you know who follow the business closely, uh, the previous uh, World Cup bid process uh, the U.S. took part in uh, and we weren't successful. Uh, and that's probably for a whole separate uh, panel at some point. But it was certainly left in our minds that there would be a strong desire to bid again if the opportunity came around. And the three presidents of the respective uh, federations from Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. Uh, got together not soon after the announcement for the expanded format and decided, hey, listen, you know, Canada was just on the back of hosting a, a successful Women's World Cup. Uh, Mexico had not hosted for some time, and they clearly had a desire uh, to have a chance to bid again, uh, including the U.S. since 1994, wanted to. And quite frankly, it came together very quickly. And there was an agreement to, to move forward with one united bid. Uh, and we felt that we could be more powerful as a, as a, as a continental bid uh, than we could individually. And that happened in December of uh, 16, uh, with the bid team then taking shape in the early part of 17. Mm. Thank you. Inigo, you, know, you were actively involved in getting to build out the bid and, and representing Mexico's interest in it. So some of your perspective. Yes, as John was saying, uh, I think that one of the smartest things that we decided together was to identify that the stronger we had better chances. And if, if we fight together between the three countries, we have different things. Of course, we have uh, maybe in Mexico more fans or, or more passion, but in the U.S. they have the best stadiums. Canada was successfully organizing the Women's uh, World Cup. And at the end, we understand that uh, from our perspective, as, as you may remember, this uh, bid was a responsible bid. We're not uh, constructing new stadiums. We're not putting the money from the taxpayers in, in the bid. And we understand that uh, for a 48 format, uh, we're talking about around 150 training sites. So you can imagine the, the size of, of the bid. It was impossible, at least for Mexico, to compete uh, alone. So we uh, see this big opportunity and we uh, raise our hand and, and say, hey guys, we, we want to be part of this big effort. Wow. So 150 training grounds plus base camps plus stadiums. Can a single country even host a World Cup anymore? I think it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think there are certainly a few countries that could, but I think part of the, the, the strategy that FIFA is embarking upon and quite frankly other uh, federations as well is that you do see more joint host. Uh, for that very reason that it reduces the burden on any single one country uh, and enables uh, neighboring countries to, to align together and, and cooperate and, and celebrate the game. Uh, so I think that we hope, and that was part of our bridge strategies, that this really does help establish a template 
uh, so that smaller nations are able to bid for, for future World Cups in partnership. Darren, you've had such a successful run with Atlanta United from coming in as possibly the greatest expansion team in modern history, probably the greatest expansion team, to winning championships, to winning over the fans. Do you think the success of Atlanta United helped with the bid and, and putting the U.S. on the global map? Yeah, I think it did, Chad. I think it was interesting because when the technical committee did their site visits, they actually came to the city of Atlanta. So we went to our training ground. We spent $60 million on a, a really great training ground. And I think the sense I got is still that perception that in America, perhaps they haven't quite got soccer. But of course, when FIFA came over and they saw that you know, we're getting crowds of average of 55,000, the passion's there. It's just the same as uh, Mexico. We're a little bit younger than Mexico, but we're trying to sort of capture that passion. And I think, I think that was important. And obviously, when you look at the stadium like Mercedes-Benz Stadium, you know, one of the best stadiums in the world, I think that, that definitely helped the bid, in my view, in terms of just showing that, you know, again, I think back, 1994 is still the most ticketed event for a World Cup. There was not even a professional league in, in that time. I was playing in, uh, in an A-league, which was like a semi-professional league in America. Now, fast forward to 2026, the 30th year of Major League Soccer, and if you've got cities like Atlanta, Seattle, you know, that are really sort of showing that passion, Los Angeles, imagine how big it could be. Yeah. I can tell you anecdotally, uh, Darren's being a little humble. Uh, as you know, when you schedule these inspection visits, you, they're very precise, minute by minute. Everything is exactly clocked out. Where are you going to go? Where are you going? What's going to be around the next corner? Uh, the amount of time that the, the FIFA inspection team decided to spend at their training center, uh, just taking it all in, I think, threw our entire schedule off for the for, for the rest of the day. But it was absolutely a highlight and an absolutely wonderful facility in terms of where the sport is going uh, in, in our country. Darren, you just mentioned 55,000 people at MLS games. Where does Atlanta United rank in global attendance compared to other football leagues, soccer leagues? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So we share the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I remember when we started the club 2017, the initial plan was going to be 29,000, which is the lower bowl of Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Uh, we're actually averaging around 55,000 over our sort of first three years. And a recent study put us 10th in the world on average attendance over the past five years. So it really is quite incredible to think that a club that's only in its third season in America, which traditionally has been sort of thought of as, you know, not a soccer country, could be pulling those type of crowds. But it's just indicative of the level of interest that there is now in soccer in the United States. And it's only growing. And, uh, you know, we're excited to be part of that journey, but we're only on the, on the start of that journey. And the World Cup in 2026 is going to be so fantastic for the sport because it's very rare in a business that you get to know about a a tentpole event that's going to be coming, you know, almost seven years away. So the, the excitement for soccer in the United States and, and North America around that World Cup is going to be pretty special. Steve, I'll volley this to you. Anyone else, feel free to chime in. There's a school of thought that exists that perhaps a World Cup or an Olympic might take some sponsorship and ticketing money away from clubs. You don't subscribe to that school of thought. You, you view it as growing the whole pie. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I absolutely believe that it's the rising tide that floats all boats. When you bring something that's on the order of magnitude of the World Cup, it's going to energize not just the city, but the region and even the entire country. So folks that might um, be sitting on the sidelines, companies, brands that might be sitting on the sidelines, they are absolutely going to get activated. So uh, I, beyond those that we already have, that, we're, that we've got great relationships through Atlanta United and through uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium, I'm 100% convinced that the World Cup is going to bring other folks in, into the game of soccer. And what's nice is they're, they're going to like what they see, and they're going to stay even after the World Cup is gone. Mm. That's correct. John, you no, I, I, I have yeah. to concur completely. Uh, I think there won't be a, a, a CMO uh, anywhere that's not talking to their teams about what's their football strategy going to be uh, leading up to 2026. And we all know there are a lot of different ways to ac access this sport to meet what a brand's objectives are. So I'm convinced that this is going to bring more and more companies into the sport. And I think once they are in, I think they're going to continue, as, uh, as Steve has said. So. Mm. In you go. I'll volley one at you. Um, we're all aware of political tensions between the U.S. and Mexico. Did that affect the bid at all? Well, of course, uh, uh, we have some difficulties. It's something that we cannot just uh, say everything was perfect. But at the end, I think that we have the political support from, from the countries. They comply with the rules that FIFA was uh, putting on that time. But uh, I think that 
beyond that, the, the important thing is that we can take football as a big uh, tool to go uh, and to trespass that kind of borders. We have a, a little joke during the beat that we were saying that it's easy to put the ball through the wall. <laughs> so football is always a, a, a strong uh, tool to change those kind of, of, of problems, tensions. And at the end, uh, our federations, of course, we have very big rivalities between the men's, Mexico, US, between the women's, US and Canada. And uh, once the, the game is over, we have great relations, and we work for our confederation, and we understand that North America, it's a big market for, for all the football and industry, and it's a, something that we work hard to, to, to achieve. So at the end, I think that the political issue, it's something that doesn't affect really what football is doing uh, to achieve these kind of events. Mm. Sport can have a, a huge social impact, can it? Steve, elaborate on what? United, Falcons, A and B group has been able to do from a social impact perspective from recent events and, and what does that look like for the future? Yeah, it's amazing that a sports, what a, the, the sort of the purpose that a sports franchise serves inside of a community and, you know, in a backdrop that feels very divided, at least in the United States, where you've got lots of disagreement uh, on, on any football Wednesday or any uh, soccer Sunday uh, people come together and 70,000 people, Atlanta United, unite and conquer is our motto and to be able to see people of different belief systems and different demographics uh, and different, different politics all come together, that's an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Nelson Mandela, sport has the power to change the world, you know, and against the political t tensions that our federations could come together and make a joint bid, um, even as we were disagreeing, even over border trade issues is, is, a, is an amazing thing and is a bit of an example that I think serves the greater society. Mm. Darren, give, give us some details on what you've, you've been building soccer pitches and out in the community. What does that look like from a club level? Yeah, look, I mean, it was part of our responsibility and as we were building the club from scratch, even bringing the players in, we made sure they understood that we couldn't expect the city of Atlanta to get behind us if we weren't committed to the city. So one of the cool projects we have is uh, particularly in the United States, there's barriers to entry from economic for youth soccer, as well as geographical. And we have a, an underground train line in, in Atlanta. So we built the first ever pitch actually inside the station. So that was our first step. And now we're going to roll out over 14 different stations. So the brilliant thing about that is the community can come, play on that pitch, and then they can travel and play. We'll call it a league of stations. We like a good pun. So we'll be uh, rolling out the league of stations. But it's just a great way of of showing that you know you can bring people together um, and it's obviously a great impact because people are seeing it right in downtown Atlanta and again that's something that we're really excited about as we go into the World Cup because you know we want to be having these sort of legacy um, social change programs rolled out because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for for the North America for Canada Mexico and the United States to really use the World Cup to, to rally the cities around uh, around the countries to make those changes. John, you led the bid. What does impact look like throughout the games and then post the games? Well, I had the fortunate position of having a title that allowed me to work with an amazing group of people because, you know, as uh, Anigo said, you know, the three countries, the way they work together. But what I like to point to as well is across the cities, you know, we were a small team. I mean, in New York, I think we had 10, 15 people. I think Anigo probably had half of that working with him in, in Mexico and Canada about the, about the same. But, you know, when you then spread it out, you know, when we first put out the calling to cities who could take part, we had a couple of key criteria, one of which was you had to have existing facilities because we said from the very beginning this was going to be a bid based on certainty. No one's going out and building new stadiums, airports, roads. And at that time, 45 cities across the three countries raised their hand. Uh, eventually, the bid that was submitted had 23 cities. But when you factor in, when we started at 45, each of those cities had teams of 10, 20, 30 people working, talking about soccer, the impact it could have in their communities, how they could organize themselves. And even as that list got smaller and smaller, those cities were, cities were still calling and saying, listen, somehow we still want to take part in this. This event means that much to us, you know, whether it is as a base camp, whether it is reinventing a fan fest. Uh, concept. How do we take advantage of all the soccer specific stadiums that we've been building, uh, particularly in the US? So to me, it was quite uh, humbling 
to see the thousands of people that got behind the, the big concept. And that's there now to be capitalized on because that interest is there. Uh, we, again, are very fortunate that the bid included more cities than ultimately we'll host. There's an oversupply still, so there'll be a, a process over the next months that FIFA will undertake to get to that final list of 16 or so cities. But the cities are, are all geared up. They've never, I think, had this sport at this level of uh, discussion with all their stakeholders at one time. Mm. Inigo, how about for Mexico? How does this change the trajectory of Mexican football? Well, of course, we identify this on, uh, as a big opportunity to get uh, at least best practices. As John was saying, for example, we were really proud of our cities because we have Mexico City competing with Atlanta, with New York. Uh, you have seen the stadium of, of this guy. It's amazing. I think it's the best stadium in the world. And of course, we have iconic stadiums like Stadio Azteca, and we have brand new stadiums like the one in Monterrey and in Guadalajara. But at the end, what we are certain is that uh, we, having the, 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 all the world looking at, at these three countries for the World Cup will bring us the opportunity to develop the game, to get better practices, to reconnect with our fans. At the end, our fans demand they won the World Cup in Mexico. They remember the 70, the 86 as, as one of the best World Cups ever. So we will uh, have the chance to, to share with these amazing uh, professionals different best practices and other things that uh, for our country, to be honest, it's something that we will really, really appreciate. And at the end, uh, we're getting better, better, better for the stadiums, better for the cities, better for the clubs. And of course, uh, this, this will have a big impact in the, in, in the junk. Uh, players of Mexico, and we hope to continue with that uh, fantastic uh, fan base and, and, and old Mexico kids trying to, to become professionals. Darren, a lot of people might not know the U.S. and Canada, the number one sport the youth play up until a certain age is soccer. Do you think a World Cup changes that? Do they remain in soccer longer, and ultimately does that create a new talent pipeline? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's something that's been interesting. As I said, I played a little bit of my background. I played in 1995, the year before Major League Soccer started. And in those days, it was when they were trying to Americanize soccer. So it, was, it wasn't high scoring enough. So the perception was that Americans couldn't cope with a nil-nil draw. You needed to have goals. Mm -hmm. So we had things like uh, kick-ins rather than throw-ins. They brought in team fouls from basketball into soccer. And it was crazy because it was neither fish nor foul. So if you were a soccer fan, you just thought, what's this gimmicky nonsense that I'm watching? And if you're on the fence, you know, just having kick-ins rather than throw-ins wasn't going to sell you on the sport. So I think what we've seen now in the growth of soccer in America is they've just kept it real and authentic. And, you know, we now absolutely have a sophisticated soccer market that's really, uh, really knowledgeable. But now you add to that the youth interest. So, you know, the younger demographic is attracted to soccer, to the passion in the stands. And the exciting thing for me, coming from uh, a background, and obviously I'm competing with the Atlanta Falcons because our owner also owns the American football team, but Julio Jones, the wide receiver for the Atlanta Falcons, just imagine if him growing up was a center forward for Atlanta United because he is unbelievably quick. You know, he'd be brilliant in the air. So I think that's the, the next sort of step for for soccer in America is getting that younger talent at an earlier stage to be learning the skills of soccer and then that talent pool just gets bigger and you know with a country the size of the United States it's only going to be a matter of time before we get that next great player hopefully you know the next Messi Ronaldo is going to be in America and hopefully in somewhere in the Atlanta region. 2026 is still a long way away. Steve you're, you come from marketing you're CMO of Mercedes when do we get out in front of this and start selling and, and, and planning on sponsorship? Most CMOs won't be in their jobs in 20 months, and, and yet they're going to be committing to something on their successors, 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 marketing budget. What does that look like? Uh, the, the good part is we've got all this lead time. Um, we're going to jump in the game just as soon as we can. The minute the final whistle blows in Qatar, I think it kicks into high gear for us. This is an historic opportunity. Like Darren mentioned, uh, we didn't have the level of professional league back in the, the last time we had the World Cup. So this is a, a window of opportunity for not just the marketers and the brands to take advantage, but for, for us to grow the entire ecosystem of soccer to a much higher degree. So we've got this amplification effect that's going to take place, and it's on all of us to maximize its benefit. Uh, the, the demographics of soccer in the United States and globally are something that everybody's 
shooting for. Like just the difference between our Falcons and our Atlanta United, our soccer and our football. There's less than a 5% overlap between our soccer audience and our football audience. And our soccer audience is younger, it's more diverse, it's more Hispanic, it's more female. So all of the coveted demographics that every CMO of every brand is going after is, is there right with our soccer. And if we can now just grow it to a, a higher level of critical mass, uh, the sport of soccer in, in America is, re really has all the promise to join the larger leagues across the world. You two shared how you're excited about how a World Cup can propel the local clubs. Inigo, is that the same atmosphere in Mexico? Are the clubs rallying behind this and, and using it for their own brand stories? Yes, for sure. Uh, as you may know, we're trying to expand our league, to bring our league to other uh, viewers and, and other uh, persons around the world and of course this opportunity will help the teams not just to, to, get, to get in the eyes and be known by, by the different uh, players in, in, the, in the World Cup but at the end of course the clubs will have this uh, piece of, of, of proud that the, at the end they are part of this effort that the federation is supported by the clubs and the clubs are doing the effort only three of them will put their stadiums but the rest of them are really glad to be part of this effort and of course they will try to, to get uh, whatever they can to, to make this part of, of their own clubs. We talked a little bit about social impact, about sport impact and, and the players. Steve, what does this look like from an economic impact? What, what are sports doing in cities? A couple of, a couple of huge benefits. Uh, n number one, uh, if you just look at the Super Bowl, we just hosted the Super Bowl. That had an estimated impact, economic impact in the city of Atlanta of somewhere near $400 million, which is, which is really, really significant. So for, for all the big brands like Delta Airlines that reside inside of uh, the city of Atlanta, uh, every one of them would have said, let me do that again. I think maybe even the more important impact is it puts the city on a global stage. I moved uh, our company from New Jersey to Atlanta, um, and lots of CEOs are out there looking at places where they might gain a competitive advantage. And uh, when you put your city uh, and it, you put its best foot forward on a global stage, that, that gets noticed. So it's not just the economic impact of the month-long event itself. It's you're talking to CEOs across the entire world who might be interested in relocating some of their company to your, your region. So it's a giant economic development forum. And if you look at it like that, suddenly it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. John, elaborate a little bit more on that. So you went to multiple cities with a, a, a request to bid or, or seeing if they were interested. How many weren't interested out of the gate? If they had a stadium that they felt was compliant, they were interested. Wow. Uh, and as I said, we went from that 45. When we got it down to 32, that's when we actually sent out the formal documentation. Because uh, for any of you who've been involved with a, a bid at this level, whether it's an Olympics or whether it's a World Cup, beyond all the pomp and circumstance, there's a lot of contracts behind it. <laughs> so it was uh, those 32 cities that received the contracts. But by the time we got through to the end of it, 23 of them still signed. And the, those that didn't, they still wanted to. They just either couldn't meet the deadlines or there were other issues. So the demand was incredibly high. Not one city ever stood up and said, we question the value. The, uh, the economic impact numbers, you know, will be significant. Uh, it's similar, you know, maybe not like for like every match you host is another Super Bowl, but it's pretty darn close to it. And we took a pretty conservative approach, and you mentioned a number of 400 million. Uh, that's about in the area that we gave guidance to the cities, uh, but a number of the cities have done their own, and it's considerably higher than that in terms of where they see the, uh, the economic impact coming. And again, it's the build-up to it that's also significant. This is more than just a 30-day competition in the summer of 2026. Uh, these events are incredibly... Uh, uh, sophisticated now in terms of the cultural tie-ins, in terms of the fan engagement opportunities, and with all the technology advancements that have been today, this will by far be the most socially engaged event in history uh, from the way we look at it. And uh, looking forward to 2026. In, in most of the world, World Cups have taken place in soccer venues. Mm -hmm. That's not actually the case, though, in, in the U.S., right? You're one of the few venues that's actually a soccer and football venue. No, it's a, it's a unique uh, dynamic, and we really owe the success of the NFL and the NFL ownership group 
Uh, and clearly, a lot of those owners have a very, very high interest uh, in the sport of soccer. There's been a tremendous investment, and you know, Darren can point to that as well across MLS for soccer-specific stadiums, which are smaller, more intimate, purpose-built for the sport. But the reality is, and as Steve mentioned to it, mentioned earlier, you know, we have these large capacity stadiums. 1994 World Cup still holds, I think actually it was Darren that mentioned it, still holds a record for the most tickets sold. So we wanted to ensure that we could put forward the largest possible uh, venues. So our average size will be 65, 67,000 seats. Uh, and that will equate to roughly 5 million tickets, which there is a high degree of confidence that every ticket will be sold to every match. Incredible. And Chad, I mean, just to, to talk about the soccer-specific stadiums, I think the great trend you're seeing now, and Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta is an example of that, you know, I'd argue it is a soccer-specific stadium because when it was built, we have the ability to retract seats in the corner so we can have a full-size pitch comfortably in the stadium. Um, we have a capacity that's about 42,000 that we call our soccer configuration, and we have curtains that come down to sort of block up the, the upper level, but the reality is, I mean, the good news for us is we had 73,000 for the MLS Cup final, actually more than we had in the Super Bowl a, a couple of months later. So it is a soccer-specific stadium because now people are being smart about when they're building those stadiums and designing them. And so the great thing is you get more fans. And, you know, that's the beauty. I always say a lot of people early on were saying, oh, you know, do you, do you wish you had a soccer-specific stadium? which is the trend of sort of the 20, 25,000. And thank goodness we didn't because we'd have 30,000 people that couldn't get in the building. I've, I've been in for a playoff match. The atmosphere is spectacular in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. The Olympics is two years after the World Cup. How competitive is seeking fans and sponsors for the World Cup versus the Olympics in, in the same territory? Look, um these events are so unique and there's so few ownable opportunities for brands to put to attach themselves to something you know and sport is is the ultimate reality television and the ratings would would uh, would bear that out so for for brands that uh, that are looking for the opportunity a thing like the Olympics is is a is, is phenomenal, as is the World Cup. So I don't think it's a zero-sum game. They're either going to put their money here or there. It's here are two opportunities within two years of each other. They're big. They're global. You can own big aspects of it as a brand. So you know, for me, this is this is what brands kind of this is what, what they live for. Uh, opportunities like that. John, was that something that was in consideration while you were building the bid? It really wasn't something we factored uh, into our thinking at all. Uh, I think it might have been a little bit different if it were the same year it were taking place, but certainly uh, the, the precedent of a, a market the size of North America being a host two major events within two years uh, didn't really directly impact us. Uh, I agree as well. I think there's more than enough opportunity for brands who want to get involved. I think many of the big brands will be looking at strategies across both, you know, a, a World Cup and an Olympics. Uh, so to us, we see it as complementary. It's also a unique dynamic in that we have a lot of people who come from the football or the soccer space who are leading the commercial side on the, on the Olympics. So I'm sure once both properties are out in the market, there'll be some healthy competition as well. Uh, but all smart brands are going to find a way to, uh, to capitalize on the opportunities, I'm sure. So the, the bid's done. It's won. Congrats. Uh, we've talked about in the near future, around 2022, selling. What does operationalizing look like right now? Are renovations taking place? Are cities figuring this out? Well, I can uh, speak to part of that. Uh, really, as it relates to the operational piece, and, and Nico, you can chime in there, it's really now for, for FIFA and the, the three member associations from Canada, Mexico, and the US to kind of set the next stage of engagement with, with all of the candidate host cities across the three countries. They are ready, ready to go. They're organizing themselves, keeping their communities involved, making sure they've got the right people you know, around the table uh, thinking about this opportunity. And that will start picking up, I suspect, in the next, uh, the next month where you'll start to see a lot more activity. Inigo and Mexico, are, are teams preparing from an operational standpoint or is it too far in the future for that? No, it's, it's something that we are uh, waiting for FIFA to decide how they want to handle the, the as, as you may know, FIFA will uh, no longer work with an LOC, with a local organizing committee. They're planning new structures. So we're waiting for FIFA to tell us what they're expecting. But of course, we have our marketing people working, our uh, rights holders working, and, and most important from the side of the federation, our team working. 
We have plans for our team to four and eight years because, of course, we see this as a big opportunity to get the best result in the history of our national team. And at the end, the business is a really important part, but for our national team, it's also the sportive part. So we are working, most of all, with our team. So uh, we hire a new coach, a great one that <laughs> was a former coach for Atlanta. <laughs> but at the end, we're working in this process through eight years because, of course, we want to take that opportunity to get the best possible result for our national team. I can feel the tension when you bring up the, the whole coach transfer. He's paid you everything he owes you. No, I'm right? glad I'm here today because I'm definitely going to get a drink after this. <laughs> Good. Yeah, he owes you a drink for it. That's for sure. We've got five minutes left. Is there anything pressing on any of your minds that you want to share as you look at this upcoming 2026 World Cup? Well, look, I'll kick off. I think it's interesting that we sort of, we forget sometimes about the sporting side of it and you know, 2026 from a sporting perspective is really important for, for the United States because, you know, we didn't qualify for the World Cup this time, which was, it was interesting because we thought going into the World Cup that it might create um, a sort of lull in the interest, but actually people were still interested. It was just that we missed an opportunity by the United States not qualifying. So I do think that's something that's important as well as the commercial side, as well as operationally making sure it's going to be a successful World Cup. It's working on the United States in particular, focusing on the team to be able to, you know, in their home country when we're hosting to put out a performance because ultimately that's why we're in the sport. It's lovely to talk about the, the commercial side and the attendance, but it's ultimately what happens on the grass. And, you know, it's going to be a big World Cup 2026 for the first team, you know, national team of America to, to be successful. Yeah, we saw it in Russia, didn't we? The whole country rallied behind when the Russian national team just went on a phenomenal run. John, yeah, it's anything definitely else? An advantage. No, I certainly agree that it really is about you know the, the build up, the excitement around the teams that are on the pitch. But another part that I'm always so humbled about and excited about is what it will do to the industry. You know, when, when you really think about the number of young professionals who are trying to get into the, the sports business. You know, the opportunities, you know, whether it's through the FIFA entities, whether it's through the national federations, whether it's the clubs, the venues, the cities, on and on and on. It will be thousands and thousands of, of people who will get their first taste uh, of what these major events look like. And I think they'll stick around as well. Uh, and they'll be the future leaders of the industry. So these events have so many different ways of impacting us. Uh, personally, I can say I never would have been where I am today if it weren't for the first World Cup that were in the U.S. in 94 because uh, that's where I first got involved with it. So to me, that's a, another area to be proud of as we, as we look for the, the seven years ahead. Steve, in you go. Final words. Yeah, for us, we're excited about um, getting ready to set a new standard for the fan experience. For us, uh, Atlanta offers so much unique from the busiest airport in the world to a downtown environment that can really host an entire World Cup population. And we want people to be able to get in and out of our venues quickly, to enjoy the time that they're there, to not be spending their entire time stuck in traffic in an Uber because we've got public transportation. So for us, we're going to put a premium on, on delivering an exceptional hospitality fan experience. Just coming off the Super Bowl, we're excited. We set a new benchmark in fan experience uh, for Super Bowls, and we're excited that we're going to now get to show that to the entire world. That's great. Uh, from my point of view, I think that one of the most important things is that with this new organization, uh, the way that we're going to do this event, we will secure and we will allow FIFA and the federations to have the money to, to develop football. At the end, we are in the football industry and we want football to continue. So uh, no more white elephants, no more money spending the things that our stadiums are used and will be used after the World Cup. So, all that money uh, will, allow, will permit FIFA and the federations to continue growing football. That is the most important thing for us. Thank you. Steve, we got, a, we got one more minute. Elaborate on Atlanta's fan experience just as a whole. You guys have set a new benchmark in sports. How's that working out with yeah, well, low well, cost? It, sessions, et cetera. It just starts with a deep respect for the fan. At the end, uh, we have a concession model that doesn't overcharge our fan. It's a, we, we call it street pricing. A hot dog costs a dollar fifty. You could feed a family of four for thirty dollars. Essentially, uh, we want to honor and respect the fan. And, and every minute that we have where they're inside of our building, we're treating that as an opportunity to build a lifelong relationship, not just a transaction where I've got you for three hours and I'm going to try to extract as many dollars out of your wallet as I possibly can. That sort of long-term long lifetime value of fan customer attitude is, I, I think, something that we need more of in the sports industry. That's great. Thank you. All of you, thank you so much for coming to Madrid, being part of the discussion.
Thank you. Chad. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Appreciate Chad. it. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Well, thank you for everything. Now time for the lunch break. At 3.15, we'll be right back here, the main stage, with an exhibition game. If you like eSports and if you like the future of uh, this kind of video games and things like that, we're going to have here people from Konami, people from Mad Lions, people from Football Club Barcelona, one of the best e-game players of the world. So. We'll see you here at 3.15. A partir de las 3 y cuarto volvemos. Tiempo ya para el descanso para que podáis comer y estar tranquilos y sobre todo relajar un poco. Y a partir de las 3 y cuarto volvemos aquí con un panel y con un partido de exhibición de dos jugadores espectaculares de eGames, de los eSports de Konami, que van a jugar un partido de exhibición del Pro Evolution Soccer. Thanks very much. See you at 3.15. Bye.